Hi, Mark. It's good to talk to you from Tennessee. I am so delighted to have this conversation with you. I've been looking forward to it all week. <laughs> well, I, we, we've been looking forward to it as well. We, as I said, we we are keen readers of uh, Content Shock and your blog, of course, which we we rarely miss. Okay, so uh, I've got a few questions for you about uh, a white paper which uh, I'm showing here on the screen, which is entitled "The Rise of Influence and Marketing in B2B Technology," which you've been uh, uh, writing with our good friends from Traka. Uh, so this is brand new, actually. It was published. Yes. Uh, a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is specifically focusing on B2B technology companies. Uh, mm -hmm. th these guys are ahead of the bunch, aren't they? The people I talked to really were. In fact, it was quite inspirational to me um, because, um, like you, I've been working in the influence space for a long time. I wrote an early book, maybe the first book on social influence marketing. Uh, that was published in 2012. So I've, I've been keenly interested in this. And I'll, and I'll tell you, it was so inspiring to hear how sophisticated this has become, hmm. how integrated this has become into mainstream marketing strategies. Hmm. So this, this was a very, very energizing exercise for me. And so uh, a lot, and that's what you said in your introduction, a lot has changed in the B2B world. Uh, which is leading, in fact, to this increasing influence of uh, importance of influence of marketing. Yes, Can you yes. Go over these changes. Of well, you know, a couple of things, and and one of the most exciting things is, I mean, when you and I were growing up in business, how would we become known? We'd have mm. to be in the newspapers. Mm. We'd have to be on television, uh, and it would have to be for something good, <laughs> <laughs> not something bad. How would that ever happen? But today, people have this opportunity to create their own power, to create their own influence by publishing consistently good quality content. And the power has shifted. The power has shifted to us. You are known. I am known from our content. We do have impact. We do have influence. Mm. And it makes sense for companies to want to connect with those people. I think the other thing that's happening is a lot of the traditional media, a lot of our reliable channels are drying up. Mm. Um, people do I mean, I never see ads on television. I watch streaming video. I, I watch stuff on Netflix and Hulu and these, these other streaming channels. I subscribe to satellite radio i don't hear ads on the radio i subscribe mm. to four online newspapers i don't see ads in newspapers in america about a third of americans have ad blockers on their phones mm. you're not even seeing digital ads so the availability of of attention for traditional ads is drying up so it only makes sense to look at who's moving the needle how do we move the needle today mm. and to some extent to an increasing extent, that's influence marketing. And those are the things that are driving this. And you also mentioned in your introduction that uh, there was uh, quite a bit of a difference between influence and marketing in the B2B and the B2C field. Well, I think there's there's a greater opportunity in, in B2B. And I, I work, I, I typically focus on B2B in my career, but I do get dragged into B2C every once in a while. and. There is just a tremendous frenzy going on to to align with uh, influencers. Mm. Um, every conversation it seems I have with marketing executives today eventually gets into influence marketing. But in B2B, you've got these long decision cycles, uh, really decisions that are built on relationships. You you They could be multi-million dollar types of, of, of decisions. And you want to build relationships with, with people you can count on in those situations. And that's where I think hmm. influence marketing, I think, is even more important, more outstanding in B2B. Absolutely. So in, the, in this uh, white paper, you're, you basically describe six trends in influencer marketing. And we're going to uh, review six of these, well, these six trends. And I've got uh, uh, a couple of questions for, for each of those. Uh, Trend number one is micro influencers. What, what, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, one of the 
trends that really, I think, uh, heart gave me some heart in this thing is that early on, people were really concerned with 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 numbers, how many followers, how much reach. And today, as the sophistication in this channel has grown, people are really digging into this to find who are the people, even in the small places that are having an impact. They're digging into blogs, mm -hmm. into forums, into groups. Uh, they're, they're involving other people in the company to say, who, who do you listen to? Who is having an impact in this? And so that, and I think that's true. It's one of the things that I have been talking about and writing about for years is that a, a lot of these metrics, a lot of these reach metrics are based on Twitter, which in many ways I think is the least impactful uh, social media platform out there. And we do need to dig deeper. Hmm. We do need to look at, at true influence in more advanced ways. And that's what's happening. So, you know, micro, I'm not sure that's, a, that's really the best term to use because these people are, might be having the biggest impact, hmm. but they may not have the largest audience. And they're, so, so basically in that, in that respect, size doesn't always matter, but- Not um, always. <laughs> not always. <laughs> but beyond that, uh, these, these micro influencers are probably less of divas as well than the, the, the larger ones. And they are probably easier to work with when you want to do UGC, user generated content, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, to me, influence, there, there are three sort of, there are three categories of influencers. You know, one is like the celebrity influence marketing, which has been around really since the, 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 the t early 20th century, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the early sports stars, the early movie stars. Then with the internet, we have people who were able to create their, their, their influence through their content. I think you and I are in that category. Mm. So whatever influence we have, it's not because, you know, we were in movies or we're sports stars or we're fashion mm. models. No, Although, you know, I, 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 <laughs> well, I, that surprises me. <laughs> um, now, the third category are these true advocates who just can't get enough of you. They love you. They're talking mm. about you. They love your products. They don't need to be paid. They don't need to be convinced. They're out there already telling your story. So finding these people, nurturing these people, rewarding these people, that's really um, a big part of influence marketing today that's growing in importance. Okay, I think we definitely are on the same page here with these micro influencers, whatever we want to call them. They're definitely very important. Number two is the necessity to lead with purpose versus promotion. Now, what do you mean by that? You mean that we, we have to stop selling? Let me, let me give you a quick example of this. So I, was, uh, I got to meet a CMO from a movie studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's happening now is many of these movie studios are involving their influencers, not just in promotion of movies, but actually <clears throat> having them in the movies. Oh. So the advertising agency had this, had this calendar of promotions. And they said, okay, on this Tuesday morning, the influencer has to promote this content. They have to do this thing. And the influencer said, I never do that. I would never do that. I never promote on Tuesdays. And they said, no, you have to do it. No, you have to do it. So there's this traditional tension of advertising and traditional marketing plans with the reality of today's online world. So he did it mm. and nothing happened. Then he said, let's do it my way. And he did it his way, his content, his voice on his time frame, mm. and it was a big hit. And one of the lessons is that we can never ever jeopardize the trust that these influencers have built with their audience. Mm -hmm. They have a purpose. They're passionate about what they do. They're expert in, in their areas. And we cannot allow them to ever do something that would jeopardize that trust, that ruins 
their effectiveness, it ruins the corporate effectiveness. Hmm. And so we need to negotiate a new mindset, maybe even a new corporate marketing culture that understands Hmm. we cannot ask these people to sell. That is the death of influence marketing. And we're going to have to ask all these VP of marketings to let go, and this is going to be yeah. quite hard, isn't it? It is going to be hard. I see mm-hmm. it every day. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm, I'm with you on this as well. Okay, uh, number three is the importance of expert voices and their relationship with brand voice. Uh, does it mean that we're going to have to work with authenticity again? Let's back, back to number two. But does that mean that we businesses are going to have to stop working with their traditional tone of voice? Well, I think that is always going to be there to some extent. Mm. I do think that there is a trend toward humanizing brands. Um, One of the things that, that I've been writing a lot and thinking a lot about, Jan, is how do we connect people in our companies Hmm. how do we make people more effective on the web i'm working with a company right now a large fortune 500 company and they said to have an effective social media presence today is a life skill Hmm. and if more of our employees have that life skill we will win as a company isn't that an amazing and a powerful statement that basically says we need to empower individual voices that's more important than the brand voice Mm. i think so many companies today are seen as distant cold institutions that's they're difficult Mm. to relate to but we can relate to people and we can love people yeah. And if we love people at different companies and different brands, I mean, I think that is really the leading edge today in terms of marketing messaging. Makes perfect sense. We're going to have to ask these people to let go again. Um, now, does it mean that a brand must accept criticism to work with these micro influencers? Can they actually run the risk of letting somebody? create content to an extent that they're going to criticize the brand or? Well, I I think there's um, a couple of things. It's a very rich question. It's a very deep question. And I think there was a comment in the research that we did that, that I thought was a wonderful insight. And the person said, you can't just look at someone's interests you also have to look at their values. Do the values align? Is that somebody what we want to work with? Now, in any event, criticism is going to happen, whether it's an influencer or not. So that's just the fact of the world today. If you work with an influencer and your values are aligned, then criticism may be a wonderful gift. Hmm. It, you know, it, 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 because these are people who they put their reputation on the line every single day. They are passionate about what they do. They are expert in what they do. And they care deeply hmm. about these products and this industry and even these companies and the people in these companies. So if you get criticism from a uh, from an influencer and look, I kind of go uh, I have two different roles. I work in influence marketing, but some people, some companies also consider me an influencer. Mm. And sometimes I am critical of of the companies Mm. because I care about them. I care about the people. I want them to succeed. And so, and I'm, and also I have to say, I think I'm having an impact. (laughs) (laughs) I think they're listening to me. (laughs) Okay. That's good. Yeah. Um, Number four is another item which I feel very close to. You say we have to transition from campaign driven activities to always on engagement. That reminds me of uh, this old book by Tara Hunt in the 2000s called uh, Pinko Marketing, if you can remember that. She, she was, a, it was not that successful from a, a marketing point of view, but from a, a content point of view, it was brilliant. And uh, she kept mentioning that, you know, we marketeers should uh, give up the use of military analogies, 
campaigns, targets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, okay, mm -hmm. so uh, what must happen now? Is it is it is it happening now? Do we have to give up on the campaigns? Boy, I have a hard time with this. Well, I don't know about you, but I, I've been trying to convince people they have to give up on campaigns, but they, they have a tough time trying to uh, figure it out. Well, so let's let's look at this from a very very high level. With a campaign, we usually have an idea, we get it approved, we get it funded. We bring in the creative people, we execute, and as we spend the money, the awareness goes up. When the money goes down, the awareness goes down. Influence marketing, it's a different mentality. Uh, it's, a, it's a different flow, really. You, you're, when you build relationships, that can't just go away. Mm. And so there's this tension on a number of fronts. Number one, it's not like you fund it and then the funding goes down. You, 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 you have to have steady connection, steady funding over long periods of time. And hopefully the awareness continues to go up, hmm. even though the funding may be stable. So the number one tension is advertising agencies aren't built for that. And many marketing departments aren't built for that. Hmm. They're built for campaigns. Yeah. And so they're almost maintaining organizationally, institutionally, mm. they're maintaining the problem. <laughs> All right. So that's number one. Number two, relationship. I mean, the relationships I have with companies, it's not with a logo or a slogan. It's with people. Mm. How do we have that consistency over time? Now, I've been very lucky. The companies I've been working with, I've I've had relationships with individuals with those companies for four or five years. That's probably pretty unusual. Mm. Um, so, <laughs> so it is really difficult uh, in 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 the execution terms to maintain mm. these relationships over time. But I think it is changing. One, you know, a, a, a key idea that I heard in this research from these amazing thought leaders is that. They, don't, they said, we don't even want to call it influence marketing. We want to call it influence relations, just mm -hmm. like media nice. relations, nice. just like investor relations. Sure. It's that important. It yes. doesn't go away. Yes. Whether these people are creating content or not, we have to know them. We have to build a relationship with them, just like the press or investors. And I think that's right. Okay, that's fantastic insights. Uh, I love this influence, influencer relations. Uh, we'll definitely have to call it that. Uh, number five is the demolition of silos in favor of cross-functional collaboration. Um, that one, I must admit, I have had a, a bit of a tough time about. Uh, you, you mentioned that PR would have to work with digital. But boy, we, we, we've heard this for, for so long now, it hasn't happened. And, uh, and how are we going to fix this then? Uh, are we going to teach these guys from PR, you know, what digital is and vice versa. It seems like we are two bunches of guys working on the same things. We're almost doing the same job and not talking to one another. Well, <clears throat> I'll let you in on a little secret. <laughs> I don't agree with that word either. <laughs> <laughs> and act actually, when, whenever we created the report in the edits, I said, I have a background in organizational development. And I know it's almost impossible to demolish silos. Exactly. Yeah. And so, in the and when it when I saw that headline, I I disagreed with it. That I, I said, you know, I just think it's. So I'm actually agreeing with you that I disagree with that headline in the room. <laughs> um, yeah, I, but I think the general, if you if you read the content under mm. that, it does make sense. And and it's because we. Influence marketing today can affect so many different parts of the company. You have to work together. And the, the most successful companies that I witnessed and that I interviewed for this report, they don't have infighting. They recognize we have to have a single point accountable person, but we have to have the involvement of everyone. And we have to collaborate and, and work together with these influencers. The influencers 
today increasingly, I think this is exciting, they're influencing the R&D departments. Mm -hmm. They're influencing engineering, mm -hmm. customer service. I mean, you know, it's, it's more than just PR and awareness. If you're only working on PR and awareness, you're not really doing influence marketing or influence relations because these people, they're industry experts. Why wouldn't they touching, be touching many parts of your organization? Mm -hmm. So I think that's the key idea. It's not necessarily that you, that look, practically speaking, if you demolish a silo, mm -hmm. you make someone's job go away. Mm -hmm, absolutely. People, people don't want that. No, they, don't. They, they resist that quite a lot. But now, so, now, now you're talking because you're mentioning businesses where people actually don't bicker and that makes me want to apply immediately for a job. Uh, <laughs> God, I haven't seen that, that thing very much in the past 30 years. But, um, okay, number six is the abolition of measurement from reach to outcomes. Yeah. Uh, that one has, uh, has had, uh, yeah, this is rung qu quite uh, quite a few bells as well with me you know the this term reach that we've seen used and i mean very often i have customers saying okay well I'll see these we, we use tweet reach and they say oh well, i've got to see this reach number this is absolutely massive and they say uh, does that mean that we've talked to that many people and i say mm, not quite not quite uh they, they don't quite understand what it what it means what it is and uh, and mostly they they most of these people haven't noticed that in the past year and a half twitter has uh, throttled uh, the the flow of tweets that that people can see and so that has gone down to practically nothing uh with uh, engagement rates down to 0.015% which is actually below what facebook is doing and so Okay, right, we understand. Reach is nothing. It doesn't mean anything. It's not measurable. But then what are we going to replace it with? Well, uh, you know, reach, of course, comes from the old advertising days, mm. you know, impressions. And so, again, it, it's kind of an institutionalized measure, isn't it? Mm. So, I mean, we're, we're in some ways, we're our, we're our own enemy because, you know, we're, we're, we're holding it up because that's, a term that we're comfortable with. The thing that I love though is that, look, connecting this to sales, connecting this to ROI, boy, it's hard. It's really, really hard. Mm -hmm. It's probably more hard in B2B than it is to B2C. But what, what companies are doing more and more are looking at qualitative measures as well as quantitative measures. Mm -hmm. And I like this idea. So a quantitative measure like sales leads or revenue, it might be hard, but what about a referral? What about getting a new employee through an influencer, a new supplier through an influencer, a new idea that, cre that helped create a new product? Mm. So more and more people are looking at what are the real qualitative benefits of relationships mm. now I mean you, you, you and I we you know we're, we're start we started to get to know each other over social media we kind of got connected through another company now look at this we're collaborating on this new piece of content together exactly where will that lead before yeah, uh, b b before we push record you and I talked about helping each other on some teaching assignments okay yeah. now What's the ROI of that? I don't know. <laughs> I would go huge. crazy. <laughs> I would go crazy trying to figure out the ROI well, of that. Yeah, but, but it's, it's actually huge. I mean, it's the, huge. It's huge, but it, but it can't huge. be measured. <laughs> it's, it's not easily measured. And yeah. so it, as a small business person, I mean, you and I don't, you know, we don't have a marketing team of dozens or hundreds. Mm -hmm. We don't spend our time thinking about what's the ROI of a social media relationship that develops into a podcast, that develops into a blog post, that develops into helping each other, that mm. may lead to whatever. Uh, you know, we you're going to be creating a blog post for for my blog. Exactly. That's going to send a, a whole new audience to your to your content. Absolutely. What's the what's the ROI of that? You will oh, never know. It's huge. <laughs> you will not. You will never ever know. And well, so, it, but it, it is huge, are, but it's, once again, it's not measured in numbers. That's it's right. It's qualitative. In, it's qualitative. Exactly, exactly. 
And so more and more businesses are – and this is something I've been preaching for, for 10 years. And mm-hmm. finally, it's starting to connect, I think, with some, with some leaders is that we have to look at if, if you're I'm, – and I'm not saying don't measure. I'm not saying yes. not connecting mm-hmm. the money isn't important. Mm-hmm. It absolutely is. And using mm-hmm. the terms, the, the language of the business is vitally important. But I'm also saying if you don't expand your mind to also include qualitative measures – that are difficult to measure, then you're missing, you, you mm. might be missing most of the value of social media, of content, and of influence relations. Couldn't agree more. So uh, here comes the end of this uh, interview. And uh, is there a way that we can connect this content shock issue that you've described with this new trend of influencer marketing, uh, which you've uh, went to length uh, uh, describing here in this uh, Tranka uh, um, white paper is is influencer marketing done the way that you describe it, not done in the old uh, advertising stroke reach way. Yeah, is is that the solution or part of the solution to the content shock? It's it's it's, it's part of the solution. It could also be part of the problem over time. Mm-hmm. So let me explain that. I mean, the idea of of, of content shock is simply saying that. As we get more and more and more and more content on the web, content is exploding. I mean, mm-hmm. just there. I mean, it's without question that 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 increases the competition, so it's harder for us to stand out. A new way for us to maneuver is through the trusted content of influencers by borrowing these amazing audiences mm-hmm. from influencers. So, absolutely, this is a way to stand out. Someone asked me the other day, could influence marketing eventually be the new content shock someday? I mean, could there be too many influencers? Could there be too much, you know, if every company starts doing that, when everything, you know, when when everybody's doing it, then it's not really different anymore. Mm. I mean, that certainly could happen, but I think we are just still at the beginning of this. There are so many companies, uh, I think fewer uh, then 20% of B2B companies have any sort of influence marketing effort at all. Wow. Although more than 80% recognize this is a strategic channel we need to look at. So we are still at the very, very early days. Mm. There are lots and lots of experts out there who really aren't aligned with brands today. Mm. Uh, so I think we're, we're in the very early days of influence marketing. Well, that's very good news because I'm very, very far away from retirement age. So, <laughs> gives me, uh, you know, some, some time to uh, look at the future and uh, look forward. Okay, well, Mark, it's been uh, a great, great pleasure talking to you and a uh, great honour as well, as I said uh, in my introductory email. And uh, I'm very pleased with this, uh, uh, the, the, these new opportunities that we've uh, we've laid out for, for both of us, I mean, both in teaching and, uh, and blog posting. And, uh, and, and besides, I, I really want to congratulate you. You're the only person in the world who can actually pronounce my first name the Celtic way. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. Maybe that's a little bit of my Celtic heritage coming through too. <laughs> so thank you so much. It's been absolutely delightful. And thank you for the, for the amazing uh, questions today. My pleasure, Mark. And we'll be in touch undoubtedly. Thank you so much.